Hello, hello, welcome to the Pure Desire Podcast on YouTube. I am your host, Trevor Windsor. This is a weekly podcast, helping you take back your life from the effects of unwanted sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. Sexual brokenness impacts us all, men and women who are stuck in shame and are unsure if healing is actually possible. Church leaders who wanna help but don't know where to start. Parents who don't know how to help their kids develop sexual integrity. Wherever you're at, this podcast is for you. Through sharing stories of healing, interviewing addiction and betrayal experts, and normalizing the conversation on sexuality, we offer a clear plan for recovery and healing from the effects of unwanted sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. You have what it takes to break free, heal your relationships, and take back your life. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. It helps us so much and really just pushes our message forward. All right, with that, let's get to this week's episode. Mike Maxwell, welcome back to the podcast, man. Thanks for being here. Yeah, super excited, bud. Yeah. So Pure Desire offers groups and group resources for men who struggle with sexual brokenness or unwanted sexual behavior, and the material and groups are called Seven Pillars of Freedom. And Mike, with your experience as a group leader, and really you were the main contact at your previous church for Mm -hmm. Pure Desire groups for a long time, we wanted to bring in your experience to this conversation. Um, this is week two of our running effective groups series. And so we're just looking at specifically seven pillars of freedom today. Um, so let's just start with this. So many people who struggle with sexual brokenness carry shame. I mean, we know that all three of us have had that as part of our story and this keeps them silent and isolated. So what are ways that we can diminish shame or the stigma in our churches? And how do we create a culture, particularly for men where it's okay to ask for help in this area? Yeah, that's a big question uh, and something we deal with yeah. all the time. I would say initially on an individual level, just being able to share your story, mm-hmm. being a person who's willing to engage with someone else appropriately, of course, mm-hmm. when the, the time is right, share your story. And um, oftentimes you'll know it resonates. They'll open up to you or they'll run away, <laughs> typically. But um, for me, I kind of became known as the porn guy at my church. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, know, seriously, yeah. put guy. that on a resume. Yeah. So, yeah. so guys knew that they could come talk to me if yeah. they wanted to. Yeah. Uh, I did notice that some kind of never came too close. They kind of circled me all the time. Yeah. Uh, and then later yeah. you find out they're going through divorce, porn's yeah. an issue, adultery, those kinds of things. So, yeah. um, so I would say individually just being a safe place for them to tell the story. And that means you tell yours, mm. um, corporately is a little more difficult because it extends beyond my ability to make those things happen. So I think initially, if you can get the pastor or um, preferably the lead pastor on your side and he's willing to talk about those things uh, from the pulpit, he's not shy and is open, then educating the staff and the volunteers in some way, uh, that might be SI 101 or something along those lines, Mm -hmm. at least getting the conversation then going, going, and then creating uh, a group or groups, education, honest discussions uh, that might be in the men's ministry, CR, um, just yeah. places where guys can actually start to talk about those things. Mm-hmm. And then I would say the, the other thing that is so important is when a man does uh, become transparent or vulnerable, applauding him for doing mm-hmm. that and rewarding yeah. him and letting him know yeah, that you're proud great. of him. I think for my journey, that's been a big piece. And I try to do that with other guys because this is a scary thing to divulge. Mm -hmm. And so when a guy does it, I want him to know that I'm safe and that I'm proud of him for being so courageous. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, Yeah, I really love what you said first there about sharing your story, because I think whether we're just attending a church, we're new at a church, we've been there a long time, or we're on staff, Mm -hmm. we're going to have opportunities, whether in a public setting or not, Mm -hmm. to be able to open up about our life and talk about what God is doing. And for so many listeners to the podcast, I think they're starting to see they have a story. And whether that's, you know, in a, a car ride where you're going with another guy to some kind of event, or it's an appropriate small group setting, or you're at a men's retreat, or they're just opportunities where, you know, here's a discussion where I could open up and say, you know, I've, I've had a long time struggle with pornography, and here's something God is doing in my life. Here's an experience I've been through that just kind of normalizes yep. healing for other men. Yep. They go, oh, and so even if your church isn't doing something, I think that's a way to just begin bringing in that topic to celebrate what God is doing in your life. And, and we've, we've brought that up that if, 
if your healing is at a place that you're not yet telling anyone else other than maybe the men that were in your online group or just you and your spouse know, yeah. um, that there are seasons where that's totally okay and even preferred. Mm -hmm. But as we get towards more healing and more traction, I think that's really a sign of health that we realize I'm comfortable owning mm -hmm. a part of my story that I maybe haven't told others before. Yeah. And when we start owning that part of our story and celebrating what mm -hmm. God is doing, I think it really gives other people a picture of, oh, that could happen for me too. And so mm -hmm. no matter what our role is in a church, uh, or if we think we can start mm -hmm. groups or not, we can tell our story. And yep. that can begin to make a difference in the lives of others who yeah. hear and go, oh, mm -hmm. maybe that could happen for me too. Yeah. And it's such a natural thing because if God has done something miraculous in your life, mm -hmm. you're naturally going to want to share that. Yeah. Um, for sure. It's just, it's just an outcome of healing. Yeah. I think my perspective is more on the corporate stuff. I think um, using inclusive language is always super helpful. Um, us and we rather than like they or them. Mm -hmm. I think that that's Good. always super, super helpful. Um, I also think that sharing statistics can be a really like kind of hear the cold hard facts about this problem, making it really clear that this is something mm -hmm. that gets struggled with, you know, across the board. It's not just that one person, you know, I, you know, I think it's Dr. Ted who's said it um, a number of times, but like, this is the one area where Satan convinces you're the only person in the world who struggles with it mm. while simultaneously impacting thousands and thousands yeah. and probably millions of people with it. Yeah. So I think sharing stats is another thing, but then also corporately, if you can get a man and a woman or a woman and a man, or just even an individual on stage sharing their story of healing and recovery, I think that that's really helpful too, because then that is like, oh, there's someone else out there who's a mm -hmm. real person, not mm -hmm. just on a video, someone mm -hmm. who's standing on stage, who's been through this, who their marriage has been healed. I think that that can go a long way too. You know, John and I were talking about this yesterday, and I said- Begaman? I, Begaman, yeah. John Begaman. John Begaman, he's great. You guys will love him. <laughs> um, but I was talking about how I felt when I went to my first church. They were very accepting, open groups, got started right away, took off. We had the ministry behind us. Mm. When I went to my second church, uh, after I married Heidi, I was kind of a new commodity to the church. Yeah. Here I am, a guy who's a self-admitted porn addict. I've been divorced. And um, I felt kind of like a missionary going into, huh. uh, yeah. you know, and John actually brought up the point. He said, you're kind of like a, pro a prophetic ministry in the sense that the prophet calls the unseen to be seen. Hmm. And I remember feeling that way as like, your church is filled with guys like me. I know this, yeah. but you don't acknowledge it. Yeah. And so how do you go do that and call the church, uh, the pastor, the ministry staff, to see what's actually happening yeah. and to address it or allow us to help them address it? <laughs> I like that you're using prophets as an illustration because... It feels like if you look at the Bible, like prophets' lives were not awesome. No. Their ministry was not awesome. <laughs> Could you even say that they were successful? Mm. Most of the time, no. Yeah. You know, but I feel, feel like that is that puts language to the experience for so many of us who want to get these groups going in church for sure. Yeah. So if a if a church uh, is launching a Seven Pillars of Freedom group for the first time, how could they do that in a way that just creates safety that makes it? Um, that makes it a doable step mm -hmm. for guys to sign up, especially if they've never really had this before in their church. Yeah. This is where I think there's two steps approach, but corporately, I think having the lead pastor involved, and uh, you guys know Alan Halavka, who was the lead pastor at Good Shepherd for a while. He was so good about saying, hey, we're going to be running this program, yeah. this video series. Yeah. We want to invite every man to go. Yeah. Every man should go, and I'm going to be the first one to sign up. Yeah, I remember and that. And he Sunday. came out and yeah. he signed up, right. and everybody, I mean, every wife in the place elbowed their husband saying, yeah. Alan's going, you got to yeah. go. Right. And so we had a really great kickoff mm -hmm. uh, at that point. There were some hurdles getting to that point, but of course. Um, yeah. that was really huge. And then I think, you know, mm -hmm. there's the, the leader demeanor when you get in those groups yeah. uh, that can help facilitate that safety as well. But initially, yeah. for the church as, as a whole, it really helps if the pastor is just not afraid to address it. Totally. I feel like in that too, emphasizing confidentiality is really, really important. I think a lot of people assume um, people will know that I've gone to this group or mm -hmm. people will know I've signed up. And so emphasizing confidentiality in the sign up process, but then also in the attendance of that group. Mm -hmm. And then I think from a leader's perspective, if you want to run an effective group, and especially starting you going first and sharing vulnerably, yeah. sharing your story, you know, and even going through, and we'll get into what the, resource covers, but 
you're in pillar one, lesson one, you're the one who's answering the questions first and you're leading the way saying, look, this is okay to admit these things. It's okay to say these things. It's okay to um, really reveal my struggle to other people to know that I've, you know, I'm in process and I'm in recovery. I think that those two things um, can be really, really helpful in, in both settings, emphasizing confidentiality and sharing your story from stage can be powerful, Mm -hmm. but those are also extremely essential for those group meetings as well. Yeah, to your point, we've used the phrase that who is in your groups should be absolutely confidential. Yes. But the fact that you have groups yes. should not be confidential. Yeah. Good. Good. Unfortunately, too many communities and churches kind of do both yeah. confidential. Like you, you, you have to be a private investigator to find where the groups mm-hmm. are and how I sign up, which only kind of can further the, the stigma or the shame of joining mm-hmm. one. Yeah. Versus when churches do it well, what we see is those groups are celebrated they're they're put on their groups finder. They're they're put on the website. Yep. Mm-hmm. There's a very clear pathway how I get in touch with mm-hmm. someone. The groups themselves are really normalized. Yep. Right. But then the entry point is just very very confidential. And to, yep. to speak very very practical, um, you need to have a way that a guy can express interest in the group when he's alone, uh, away from the presence of friends or family or a spouse, mm-hmm. because. If a church does, you know, the typical, if you're interested in this group, fill out the connection card and drop Raise it in your the plate, hand. you know, or yeah. leave it at the Scan back. Scan this QR code. Yeah. Right. What yeah. we have found is right. that for probably half of the men that enter group, their spouse isn't aware to the level to which yeah. they need group. That, That's true. That is just a common situation mm-hmm. in a relationship that he's not being totally transparent at home. Sometimes he just doesn't know how to be, or he thinks it's even better that the wife doesn't know. And so if he's sitting there going, I'd like to join Seven Pillars of Freedom. And the wife is sitting next to him going, why is he saying he needs to join Seven Pillars of Freedom? So having a way that confidentially Mm -hmm. a guy could text Mm -hmm. a phone number, could send an email um, when they're at work the next day, that's going to be much, much better. And then in addition to that, also make sure it's clear who will know that they're expressing interest to say, Mm -hmm. you know, if, if Mike was our group leader, I'd say, Here's Mike's telephone number. You can text or call him anytime right. and get information about where the group meets and yep. when. Yep. Uh, and he is the only one that will know you're reaching out to him. Mm-hmm. That's not being shared with the staff. Right. That There's not right. a list that we'll keep mm-hmm. in the office. Right. He is the only one that will know because we want to keep your participation confidential. And that just, that may seem like overkill to some, but it gives a person the ability to take that first step. Because as I say all the time, the first step is the biggest. Mm -hmm. That first step is the biggest. So do whatever you can to try to make it a little bit smaller for someone to confidentially raise their hand and say, I need this group. You know, it's interesting you bring that up because when we we finally got buying it, Good Shepherd, uh, we initially ran a video series. uh, About 200 guys signed up to see it. It's a lot. But then when the video series is, well, here's what's interesting about that. We had tables of 10, and I had my group leaders that were collecting information. And so I said to them, I said, based on the guys at your table, what percentage would you say have admitted that they struggle? And they said about 8 out of 10. So out of 200 guys, you got 8 out of 10 that are struggling. But when we finished the video series and time to go into seven pillars, Mm -hmm. the, the transition was very low. And it was exactly what you were talking about, Nick, is if I'm, it's okay here. But if I move into seven pillars, my wife will know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so it just was a lower, much lower participation, which was a little frustrating, yeah. but I totally understand because there's a lot of pain that comes with that uh, revelation. Yeah. And I know sometimes churches can be kind of numerically driven of like, well, if it's successful, 200 guys, then we should have 180 that are in these seven pillars yeah. groups. And if it's only 20 or 15... They can look at it and feel like, well, that was unsuccessful. And I, mm-hmm. I try to share with leaders, no, that's, that's very normal, that it's like a funnel. You want to have a really big top that as many mm-hmm. people come in as mm-hmm. possible, yep. and it's going to go down to a much smaller uh, entry point, especially if you're just starting these groups, mm-hmm. because there is a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of mystery. Mm-hmm. But if you have a few groups that are run well, where men are experiencing freedom, and they start sharing their story then even those groups will begin to grow because people see that, yeah. oh, this, this really is safe. Our church really does mm-hmm. want to help. I really could join in. And so um, I, I had a similar experience at our church where we had like 50-some guys do the video series, and only five to 10 of those signed up to do the ongoing groups. But I watched over the next couple of years yes. mm-hmm. how it ended up being closer to 20 to 25 of them. Yep. It just took some guys longer to get yep. to that point yeah. yep. of, of taking that step. But yep. it was the safe entry point, I think, that gave them the thought that maybe one day I could do this. Yeah. 
Yeah. The other side of that is when you have too many that transition too quickly, you don't have the quality of leadership to lead the groups. So by having that smaller group that does come through, yeah. you can build a better quality team. It's not a like terrible byproduct. Leadership yeah. snowball, right. so to for speak. Sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So kind of related to that, um, for many men and even for many churches, there can be an assumption that seven pillars of freedom groups are, are kind of separate mm -hmm. from other discipleship approaches. But why is this not the case? How are these groups uh, a vital part of spiritual growth for men? I'll get there, but I, I'm going to get there roundabout probably. Okay. <laughs> uh, when I first was early in my recovery, I read the book, The Cure. And I don't remember a lot about the book, but I do remember one super impactful thing, at least to me. And, and what he said was, uh, as disciples, we are meant to love others as Jesus loves us. However, when we have hidden sin mm -hmm. in our lives, we can't receive that love because the people that are loving us, whether we acknowledge this consciously or subconsciously, are uninformed of who we really are. Mm -hmm. And so we know that we, and we believe, we aren't lovable. If they knew who we were, they wouldn't love us. Yeah. So that love can't actually go through us. Mm -hmm. It blocks mm -hmm. yeah. there, and we can't receive it. So with that in mm -hmm. mind, if you think about trying to disciple someone that can't receive love because they have unresolved trauma or addiction totally. in their life, it's not going to be effective. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at this is uh, seven pillars is that process of going through and cleaning out that sin, confession, and then that love of Jesus can actually flow through you, and you can actually receive discipleship. The extreme I always ask is, if I was to tell you seven out of ten men in your church were addicted to meth, how effective would your discipleship program be? Well, you'd go, the first thing i got to do is get them off meth. Yeah, yeah, So that exactly. they can become disciples. Right, right, because that's such a hindrance for sure. And even understanding, too, like the motive, because the more you understand about sexual brokenness, you understand it's not actually about sex. That has far more to do with... Um, the wounds and the trauma that we've experienced in our past, also mm -hmm. our family of origin, all mm -hmm. of that. And so I think in that way, you're taking uh, much more of a, not just saying like the past is the past, but looking at how a person got to where they are. And discipleship has to incorporate that. Mm -hmm. Like I have to know where I've been in order to know how to get to where I want to get right. to. Like, I think that's a really important piece. But then I mentioned this on the previous episode too, and I feel like it's going to come up in every single one of these episodes in this series is that our discipleship has to be holistic. It mm -hmm. cannot be, we're only going to like give you basically all this brain knowledge about what the Bible says, about theology, about what it means to be a disciple, but not talk to you about how to treat your body yeah. or not, uh, you know, how to take care of yourself mentally. Yeah. And sexuality is something we're born with. It is yeah. part, it's literally built into us from the day we were born. Uh, we're, as God is forming us in our mother's womb, sexuality is a part of that formation. Mm -hmm. And so... If we want our discipleship to actually be something that people are growing and becoming better versions of themselves, becoming more like Jesus, mm -hmm. becoming better husbands and wives, our discipleship has to incorporate sexuality because yeah. it is a part of the holistic being we are. Yeah, it, it seems like a big part of spiritual growth is removing the barriers that keep us from growing. 100%. Right. I mean, if, if you've got a garden and you've got really terrible soil, it doesn't matter how much time and work you put into the seeds and water and for like the soil is going to keep the growth from happening. Yep. Or if, mm -hmm. if we were doing, you know, to your point, Mike, if, if there's some secret un, undiagnosed battle with pornography or sexual sin, other things are just going to bounce off. It'd be like if you were doing a financial, you know, stewardship class and someone never revealed that they have a hidden secret mm -hmm. credit card and a $20,000 bill that's hanging over their head. It doesn't matter all the other budgeting techniques and, mm -hmm. you know, tracking software. Like it's not going to help unless you know that, We've got to deal with this unaddressed right. part of your life. And I, I think the same is true in our sexuality, that it, it may not seem like on the same level as Bible study and prayer and some of the typical spiritual disciplines, but, right. but I guarantee if someone has this issue unresolved in their life, it is a constant block for them. Mm -hmm. And so to free them of that hindrance is to free them for greater growth. Yes, yes. And I think when we see that, it, it just impacts every area of our discipleship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. When uh, this term, I don't know if, I don't think I developed this, but I remember feeling when I was in my addiction, I was doing all the right things at church. I was volunteering. I was involved in parachurch ministries and yeah. youth ministry and those kinds of things. But I, I look back now and I was spiritually neutered, so to speak. Mm. I looked good yeah. and no one could tell that I had an issue, mm -hmm. but inside uh, I just was stunted. I couldn't grow. Yeah. And there was some frustration there. And in some respects, I think when you try and disciple someone who has that blockage, it just increases their shame because on some level they go, right. 
if I was a real Christian, I would be growing. I would yeah. be feeling the presence of Jesus. I would right. be doing all these things, and yeah. I'm not. And I've got this hidden sin that I can't, I can't get past. You know, in my mind, the lie I was believed was if you were a real man, mm. you could overcome this on your own. Right. Right. Um, and so here I was hidden in this uh, kind of stunted spiritual growth stage. Mm -hmm. Looked all the part. I attended church every week. I was there on Wednesdays. Right. Very involved. Yeah. But I wasn't living the life that God had called me to live. Yeah. And I couldn't. Right. Yeah. A, a couple of different things are coming to mind, but I just feel like if your body, if you have cancer in your body and you're expecting to function properly, uh, like that's just silly to think about. Mm -hmm. But sexual addiction, sexual brokenness can be so cancerous in your soul, in your yeah. body, that you're not able to function properly. And so assuming that I can just tell someone who has cancer, like, well, just get up, go for a run every day. It'll be good for you. It's like, well, I can't. I physically am not right. capable of actually oh, doing that. Good. And so I feel like that's a mm -hmm. maybe just another illustration to use because I, I, I just this is something that is so deeply seated and rooted to who we are as people, the way God created us. And is the one area we feel most shame about, in my opinion, but I, I, I think that it's the mm -hmm. most shameful mm -hmm. area or topic that we have in the church. And yeah, I just, again, echoing everything that we said, mm -hmm. it is, it should be a part of the discipleship process. Absolutely. Okay. So let's kind of pivot a little bit here to what is covered in the seven pillars of freedom material. So what, what topics, what, um, what themes do we process through as we go through the material? And then what are the weekly meetings? and weekly time commitments look like as well? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, the Pillars is a comprehensive course that, you know, they, they say it takes 10 months. Sometimes it takes as much as 12, mm -hmm. just because there's a lot of information to process. Yeah. And if you want everybody to participate, sometimes it's going to go a little longer. Um, you know, they want you to have homework for 30 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, two hours a week is a commitment. You know, we have structures to how the, the meetings are run. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of stuff you learn. I, I was kind of processing this question, and I remember, um, well, I had been through about, I would say I've had about five years of counseling in total in, in fits and spurts. I remember when I finished Pillars for the first time, I told somebody that was worth three years of counseling mm -hmm. that I had spent 15 grand on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I accomplished yeah. that in one year right. where I'd been going to weekly sessions. The kit is 80 bucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 80 <laughs> right. bucks, 15,000. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And so, um, you know, there is a lot in yeah. it. Um, and I think the piece that was uh, so valuable for me was the trauma piece. Nobody, mm. I don't know. Most people go, I don't have any trauma. Yeah. You know? And then as you work through that, you go, holy moly, I have a lot of lies that I believe based on the things that have happened to mm -hmm. me. And those lies are affecting the way I view life. Yeah. And navigate my relationships with other people. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. The the weekly commitment, you know, that we talk about, especially when you're early in the journey, is just making a plan that every day I'm going to do a little bit of work. And I think the way that that yep. keeps our brain and our mind engaged in our healing is is really really important. And we say if you had 20 to 30 minutes a day, you can cover it. I think most men find if they are spending 20 to 30 minutes a day, they get all the work done probably within the first three to four days, yeah. most weeks. Some yeah. lessons are a little longer, but, yeah. but the invitation every week is to do some, some self-assessment to interact with the material. Mm -hmm. Because you know, Mike says it's a lot of information, and it is, but we're not just trying to gain information. Mm -hmm. We're actually trying to apply it. We're actually trying to understand what's happened in our story and how to relate to it, and then yeah. to bring that to the group so yeah. we have something to share. And so you've got usually uh, some of that kind of self-assessment within each lesson. But then we also do a weekly uh, evaluation of just where am I at in terms of an emotional uh, relapse kind of scale yep. that we call the faster scale and the commitment to change, which we've talked about those on other episodes. But there's yeah. some weekly tools that you use that are part of that that work between groups and then interacting with the lesson. So um, I've, I've told guys 20 to 30 minutes a day, you'll probably get that done in three, four days every week if you're doing that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's doable. Uh, when, you know, when a guy says to me, oh, I just, I just didn't have time for the work. It's like, well, let's talk about your week. Like how many hours did you work? And, and then you find out that, well, they actually were able to, to get in, you know, 12 episodes of their favorite television show or right. that they spent Friday, Saturday on an overnight fishing trip. And it's like, hey, great. And I, I, I try to not ever say you shouldn't do those things, yeah. but to bring it up as kind of a question of priority. Like if, yeah. if this truly is something you want out of your life, we have to make healing a priority. And mm -hmm. if we are able to spend 12 hours watching our favorite TV show, but we didn't get around to the work, is it a question of time or is it a question of, of our commitment level? Mm -hmm. And so 
when you when you bring it up that way and you say to a guy, do you have 20 to 30 minutes a day to work on your healing? It's like, well, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. It's like, okay, then you've got more than enough time yeah. uh, to do the group work. And then, you know, the weekly commitment to the group itself yeah. is a, a two hour group commitment. Yeah. And we, even with the weekly recovery work, it's not necessarily, because I think it's not just, oh, I have to be in my workbook or I have to be in my journal. It could be listening to podcasts. It could be making mm -hmm. your weekly phone calls. Like, it could be, there are other aspects to it that make it much more of an experience. It's Developing not just, a devotional it's not just writing yeah. stuff down in a book for sure. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to mention that the weekly meetings are the 40, 60, 20 plan. We talk about 40 minutes is going through your faster scale, your commitment to change, recapping what the week was, 60 minutes going through the material that you worked through in the workbook, mm -hmm. and then 20 minutes looking at your commitment to change in the meeting. And so it really is something where you're evaluating where you were that week you're sharing and experiencing. And one of my favorite parts of group in that when you're going through the weekly work that you have done in the workbook is you're getting to hear other guys experience and you're making connections yeah. in your mind. Like, oh, I didn't think about that. Oh yeah, I've had a similar experience and oh, okay, I'm going to write that down. And there's so many, so many moments of self-discovery that can happen both mm -hmm. when you're doing it mm -hmm. um, during the week, doing your actual work, but then when you're actually listening to other guys share and having those conversations, that is just a beautiful time. But then the last 20 minutes is really just looking at what can I do this week to continue stepping forward in recovery. And so it's very, like, to me, that's just a great model in general. I mean, if every Bible study was set up that way, that'd be great. Yeah. You know, but I really do think that it's important to just understand that there's a plan going into it. It's not just everybody's going in and we're just going to share how'd you do this week. And then maybe someone cried, maybe someone didn't share. Like, no, everyone gets in, everyone shares, everyone is invested in this 40, 60, 20 plan. Some of the biggest ahas I've had are listening to what someone else said yeah. and something clicked in yeah. my mind. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, and, and your brain is looking for that connection that mm -hmm. I'm not alone. Other mm -hmm. people understand it's, yep. it's, it's not just an insight thing. I mean, it is insight, but it's the way that it sh creates shared experience with others yep. mm -hmm. that invites us into community rather than staying in isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mike, I know you've had this experience a couple of times where churches have never had a group, never run groups. How could someone within a church approach their leadership about possibly running these groups for the first time? Well, it's interesting because, like I said, the second church I went to, uh, I had a few advocates on the inside, but the leadership wasn't. And, and I don't blame them. I was a new commodity to the church. I was on fire for Jesus, wanting to help other guys. Mm -hmm. you know. And I came in like a wrecking ball, so to speak. And, <laughs> and they were hesitant, of course. Um, they didn't deny the problem because they knew it was there. So they kind of gave us a modular way off yeah. on the corner, you know. Which uh, is at least something. It was something. Some it was a place don't to get start. Always get that yeah. too. Yeah. And I was grateful for that. Yeah. The thing that I was lacking was credibility. Mm -hmm. And in all honesty, it wasn't until Nick and I made connection and he came to the church with his degrees and seminary degrees yeah. as a pastor. Executive director, his yeah. role. And, and yep, spoke. For sure. And all of a sudden, it was like the doors opened, up, yep. opened wide. So part of the challenge is when we go to a church, you know, depending on the church, you might not have the degrees that they want you to have. They're not going to allow you to, you know, mm. I think one of the biggest lies is the devil will tell you, you are not qualified for ministry because of what you've done. Mm. And he, he told me that. And I believed it. And I was like, please, God, do not let me be yeah. done. But what I realize now is what God has allowed me to go through and my healing qualifies me mm. for ministry in a way yeah. that some of these pastors cannot, Second they cannot do. Man. Second Corinthians. Um, and so... That's such a beautiful thing. And mm -hmm. so uh, if anybody is listening to this that believes that, yeah. it's a lie. This actually may be the greatest thing that's ever happened to you as far as ministry. You know, with that too, and you know, we've talked about this, that when you experience recovery and healing and you really start to make some traction, it's like you've just won the lottery. It's mm -hmm. like, I've been looking for this. I've been trying. I've been buying lottery cards every single week my entire life. And finally, something has worked. Something's happened to me. And we want to share with everybody about it. Um, I think that there needs to be tact and patience in the way you develop relationships with mm -hmm. your leaders. You know, mm -hmm. we talked about it uh, last episode. We talked about it a lot on the podcast that like you can't just come in and say, you're doing this wrong. There's a problem. Here's how we fix it. Run with it. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You have to understand that relationship needs to be built because for you, the known commodity piece is you just probably didn't have the rapport mm -hmm. that people have with the leaders there who've been there for maybe yep. 10 years, yep. right? So like 
And again, you have to understand there's this balance where you're not manipulating, but you are getting to know your leaders. You're starting to share your story. You're starting to become familiar with what the church does, the systems and structures that they have, their discipleship model, all of that. But be patient. You know, it may take a year to finally get that first group to launch, but I'm going to tell you what, the healing that's going to come after mm-hmm. that first yeah. group is worth that year of work that you put in. Yeah. And so pace yourself, be patient, and don't feel like you have to come in and change the game out the gate because right. that's honestly you're just going to be discouraged and probably walk away or try to find another yeah. church and maybe you were the advocate god wanted at that church for that time yeah. to build those relationships to start groups i wish i'd had the group pathway honestly because it gives mm. it would have given me some credibility yeah. that i didn't have yeah and so we've got this tool called the group pathway and it's a uh, an introduction video by nick there's um an invitation video from him Mm-hmm. A testimonial video of Josh uh, Putnam and his wife, Shana, yeah. who is so an good. amazing worship leader. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. We love we've Josh. We've got Nick and Michelle's uh, Focus on the Family mm-hmm. interview. Lots of tools that are catered to a pastor mm-hmm. to give credibility to what you're wanting to present to them. Yeah, And it also has some email templates that you can customize, make it personal. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the greatest things is it connects... Uh, it connects that minister to a ministry where you've received healing. It's kind of a triangle thing where yeah. it connects all three of us together where yeah. we are there to help you mm-hmm. uh, take whatever steps are necessary. We'll even actually have our staff meet with your pastor mm-hmm. to help you start groups. So um, there's a lot of hindrances, but this tool is a big help. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The group pathway will be in the show notes too. Yep. So check that out because we're really excited to kind of have that together that volunteers That's can beautiful. take and have something to offer. Um, and, and I tell people all the time, I say, you know, when you're talking to a pastor or leader, invite skepticism, mm-hmm. like welcome it. Don't, don't be turned off or bothered by that because the truth is you may know pure desire way better than they do. Mm-hmm. And they've heard about a lot of stuff that's out there, a lot of approaches. I mean, maybe they've even heard things about pure desire that aren't entirely accurate, yeah. uh, but that put us in a negative light or they think certain things about it, like, oh, they're just that, or they're just into psychology, or it's mm-hmm. like, invite skepticism to say, hey, w- would you check it out? Because I think there's more to it. Um, I've got a video you could watch. You know, we give pastors and leaders access to watch the whole first session of Sexual Integrity 101, yep. which really does give an overview, I think, of our healing process. And so whatever uh, you can do, don't be turned off by that. Say, would, would mm-hmm. you check it out? Would you look into it? Mm-hmm. And then just making yourself available to say, and I'm, I'm here to help. You know, and depending where you're at, yeah. um, as you brought up, Mike, in how long have you been at that church? How well are you known? And, and maybe your healing is pretty fresh and, and leaders may have an understandable level of, are you really ready to be yeah. taking part in this? Like that skepticism is fair. And so yeah. I think just making yourself available to yeah. the level the church is willing to let you be involved, yeah. it's good. And then trusting, like, like Trevor said, trusting uh, God to lead that process. And that yeah. if it takes some time, that's okay. But in that patient, you know, <clears throat> just continuing to gently bring up the opportunities, believing that, that God will open the door when the time is right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So um, what does leadership training look like specifically for leading Seven Pillars of Freedom for Men? Uh, in the past, I mean, we have, we have, we have had kind of a stepping stone, mm-hmm. participate in a group, co-lead a group, lead a group, um, and that has worked. I mean, the, it's discipleship taking totally. place. Yep. However, one of the downsides to that is you find that it's kind of like telephone where uh, <laughs> yeah. the structure and everything kind of gets... You know, they might be playing beer pong at the end of the group. Who knows? Um, <laughs> that would be a new one. I don't How did you, like, <laughs> I didn't know that you knew that my groups did that at the yeah. end of every... Busted. Yeah. Um, but recently, <laughs> we came up yeah. with a group leading uh, group leader training process. Mm-hmm. And it's a video it was, course, right? It was yep. meant to uh, kind of create some structure and uh, consistency over what the group leaders are learning. Mm-hmm. And it also provides a connection back to us and our group's team so that we become a resource for those group leaders. Yeah. So it's, I think it's got eight videos. There's probably 50 modules, five to seven minutes, yeah, six hours of yeah. con- uh, content, yeah, very structured. And you will learn things from this that you would never have learned from your leader because things do come up. Yeah. Um, you know, how do I handle somebody who's um, looking at child porn? Yeah. You know, right. Yep. How do I handle these things? Yep. And so this is going to give us much more consistency across the leadership, um, the group leaders. And it is just a great resource. Yep. Yeah. And we like to tell people that the person who is most qualified to lead a group is someone who has been through a group mm-hmm. right. and experienced healing for themselves. And yep. kind of like you said, because of our story, 
we may feel like we're, we're disqualified and maybe we're permanently disqualified even for healthier. Yeah. When the truth is these groups are not led by experts. They're not meant to be led by teachers or counselors. Mm -hmm. They're meant to be led by someone who is in the fray with all the other guys. Like yeah. I'm in this for myself and, and hopefully I'm a little bit down the road and I'm experiencing some healing, but that is just what we said earlier. That is what qualifies you. Yeah. And so if your church is ready to um, have you serve, and I, I think that's an important part of it at the local church level, we always want to do it in conjunction with church leadership. So, so they have a role to play in, in vetting their leaders. And if, if they feel comfortable with you leading, you don't need to have gone to you know, some master's degree program. Mm -hmm. If you've been through group and you're experiencing healing, you can lead. And then the group leader training is just to help add to your tool chest so that you're more equipped and more familiar with the process. Yep. But it is your experience that equips you. So don't ever undersell that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. As you go through group, I'm always looking for... Uh, the the guys in the group that will that are going to be group mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. because that's my goal is to yeah. replicate myself and have some kind of legacy related mm -hmm. to this ministry and there are guys that will they're type A they're gonna go I got it I'm gonna take off just give me the books I'm gonna yep. round up twelve guys and yep. pull them in a group and but then you also have the guys that are like I've got sobriety, I'm living well, but I'm just not sure I'm mm -hmm. qualified yep. or I have the confidence. Right. And I think this is just one more really comprehensive tool that can give them the confidence to go, I know how to yeah. run a group. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think um, just some supplemental things. Like for me, my experience, I the group leader training wasn't around when I first started leading groups and there was no one at my church who'd led groups before. So I just went for it. Mm. And I think that happens from time to time. Um, the group leader training is obviously where we want you to start, like go there first. Um, but you also have like our weekly podcast, our blogs, our groups uh, team that we have here. Also, we have church group advisors, uh, which are also, you know, regional people that oversee and offer support to leaders. And so just know that those are also really, there are aspects to development and growing. Yeah. I mean, they're things that we can leverage for sure for our benefit. That is such a good point because uh, the podcast has kind of backfilled in that respect because we've got stuff on the faster scale, the double bind, some of these really difficult things to yeah. try and understand initially. Yeah. There's some great podcasts on that. And so I have seen a lot of guys that are just self-starters will go, okay, I'm just going to start listening to all the podcasts on leadership. You know, something that we haven't mentioned yet too is um, with this new update to seven pillars that we've made, we have a video component to it. There's a video companion where Nick, you're teaching that um, and that's really good for group leaders too, as they're getting into it to watch ahead, maybe mm -hmm. a week so that Great you know point. what's coming. Well, it's really for the whole group. It is for the ahead. whole group. Absolutely. It answers a lot of the questions about yes. how do I answer these questions? Yes. What's the purpose right. of this lesson? Yep. But I think yeah. as a leader watching, like if you know that you're getting into pillar one, lesson two, maybe before that group, watch video three, because that will give you some prompts as to some, because this, yeah. this is really in, this was created to help people have clarity and you know really clear the deck so you know exactly what we're getting into this mm -hmm. week and what to focus on and so as a leader that could be just a really practical thing yeah. too to set you up and i think i wear this same shirt in one of those videos so 100%. That's, that's kind of funny 100%. <laughs> uh, so mike let's talk about another issue that churches face you know especially when they're launching groups a concern might be if, if we open the door to this we actually have too many men and you know we talk about the ideal group size being you know six or seven men max with their leader what if a church has more than that? What can they do to handle a situation where there are too many guys and not enough leaders for a group? This is a challenge. I've had this happen a couple of times. It's not a bad problem to have. No, uh, but it, it's it, like it can be a parking challenge. lot's too full, right? Right. Like, well, like, oh, a good gosh. problem. Yeah, right. right. Um, in one of those situations, I had a co-leader, and so we would kind of debrief before and split. But in, in many cases, that's not uh, a solution because you only have one leader and you can't split. So. Uh, a couple of tactics, tactics I have uh, used is right at the beginning when you do your check-in, that's where a lot of groups uh, lose control. And uh, I'm kind of a rule follower, so I like to try and stick kind to of? that 40 minutes. Kind of? So I've, I've <laughs> often used a timer on my phone and just say, guys, there's eight of us in this group. We got 40 minutes. You got five minutes a piece. Mm. Start by reading what you wrote. Yeah. We'll ask questions if we have them. Um, because if you don't set those parameters, yeah. some guy will be telling you about his fence project and going on and on sometimes. <laughs> so you just have to, that seems to be the place where people get stuck. Yeah. Then, uh, as you get into the homework section, you can kind of have them stick to the writing too. And 
uh, because they can really get off there. But the, the intro is usually where guys lose it. Mm. I mean, I've talked to group leaders who go like, how do you guys get through the homework? It takes us an hour and a half to get through check-in. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. you need to get some control on Which the check-in. why you should watch the group leader training. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you can split off. You know, I think that, um, again, this was my experience. My first group, I, I probably had two or three guys who could have led a group, even though they'd never been through it. They could at least facilitate it. Right. You know, and there is that kind of approach that we, that historically at Pure Desire was like, if you have a pulse and you can push play, then you can lead a conquer group, you know, right. or if you can show up every week and yeah. share first, then you can lead a seven pillars group. And so I think at some level you may get to that point mm -hmm. um, where that's kind of like a half measure, at least a step to offer more things. But I think this is a great, um, to me, this emphasizes the need to offer multiple groups throughout the year or group starts mm -hmm. that if you can sort of, um, cast that out where maybe you start a group in January and then in May you start another group and then, you know, three months later you start another group. I think that that can help with this. It's not a perfect solution, yeah. but at least offers like we're full right now. We got 10 guys and we're having a hard enough. Like Mike is giving mm -hmm. us five minutes to share every week. We cannot add another person. Yeah. yeah. But knowing in two months, in one month and three months, there's going to be another group started. Sign up for that right now. Mm -hmm. That can at least give people hope that I am going to get into a group if we have too many guys. Yeah. There's definitely an idea though. If you, you want to strike while the iron is hot. Yeah. I mean, if you've got 14 guys that are ready to jump into group, you don't want to tell half of them, well, sorry, it'll be six months. Yeah. Because what I've seen happen over and over is in six months, they've decided, oh, I don't really need yeah. this. I'm not ready. Yeah. Or so, they're divorced. So figure right. out, yeah, what you can yeah. do. So that might mean like, oh, we have more than we thought. We're actually going to start with Sexual Integrity 101. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through all of this together. Because you can do that with a larger group yep. and yep. break into discussions. Yep. And while you're doing that, if you're the one leader, you're looking for, okay, who else could take a group? Yep. And starting yeah. to work with them during SI 101 and getting them to go through the group leader training. Mm -hmm. So that by the time you're at the end of that, you could launch two groups. Right. So that's a that's possibility. Good. That's great. Um, another thing that you could recommend is Pure Desires online groups. Could yep. be a place that several guys could jump in on um, while there's maybe no room in the mm -hmm. local church. Um, one other thing I've seen, if, if you're kind of in that borderline zone, you've got eight to 10 guys. Um, I will usually start because I've seen there's typically an attrition, especially mm -hmm. in the local church where people are coming, you know, other than buying the workbooks, they haven't had to commit or yeah. mm -hmm. um, there's some voluntary participation. It's not uncommon to have, um, you know, 10 to 20% drop out in the mm -hmm. first few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And I will almost try to, <laughs> you know, not in a mean way, but I'll emphasize this has got to be your priority. Yeah. You have got to be here every week. You've got to do the work. Mm -hmm. You've got to be committed to it. And I'll just find even maybe after that first meeting, some of the guys that said they were in yep. are like, mm -hmm. uh, actually, you know, my work schedule or, you know, they, yeah. they come up with reasons and, and I'm fine with that. It's like, okay, they're not ready. And, yep. and I'll end up with six or seven guys. So if you're in that borderline eight to 10 guys, mm -hmm. um, just emphasize all of the commitments and you'll probably end up with seven or eight and you can make it work. Another, just, I'm just kind of spitballing. There may be other churches in your area that are offering groups too. Yeah, and it's not idea. the worst to say, you know what, we're full, but I know a church right down the street who runs groups and they're starting one in a few weeks or they have one going right now and help make that connection. Like as the leader, help facilitate that connection to that group leader at that other church. But I think that that's just another option. Um, I know there are local churches around here that if we ran into that at the church you and I attend, like, yep. or used to attend, sorry, <laughs> we don't go to the same church anymore. No confusion there. But if you have that happen, just knowing like, oh, hey, there's this church down the road. Yeah. I think that can be helpful and hopeful for guys. I've um, actually done that yeah. uh, quite a bit. when Because when we first started groups, like you show the SI 101, you have three groups start all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then slowly you have three or four guys that contact you and want to get in a group. So our goal was eventually to try to have groups that were starting quarterly. Um, and I love the idea of showing SI 101 quarterly as yeah. well, because yeah. then it can get them in yeah. the process so that they're feeling like they're doing something until mm -hmm. their group can fill. Yeah. The other thing I was going to bring up at this point was um, having relationships with key people in your church, like your family pastor, mm -hmm. the men's ministry. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, that can refer guys to you because what'll happen is sometimes you'll get two guys and you're like, well, we're just waiting for two more. Yeah. And so if you can get some referrals from the men's ministry, the family pastor, um, I would, I would also say you have your guys get involved, encourage them to be involved in men's yeah. ministry and CR if that's yeah. applicable so yeah. that they can share their story. And, uh, mm -hmm. through sharing their story, other people will want to join too. Yep. So you can get kind of that momentum. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, we've kind of answered the next question. I, I think that's what I saw in the church that I led, where if, if we had a group starting about every three to four months, it was good timing yep. because we were sharing people's stories. We were yep. highlighting the groups. Yep. I, I think in some church contexts, there is there is a mindset that September, October is just when all of our groups mm-hmm. start. Mm-hmm. And so you definitely want to have a group that launches then. Yeah. Um, and if, if in your context, that's the only time they're allowed to start, you know, you need to work with that. You need to be um, uh, under your leadership and, mm-hmm. and do the best you can. But I think to cast the vision of, boy, if we could launch a group in September, if there mm-hmm. is kind of a, hey, we're we're coming back into routines. It's a good time to start. But what I also found is, and we talked about it on this podcast a lot, that holidays can be rough yep. mm-hmm. for patterns yep. and relapses. And yep. if you have a group starting in January, there is kind of a, okay, start off, fresh start, new year. Yep. That can be a great launching yes, point. And then I, I found again um, that shortly after Easter or spring break was a good launching time because mm-hmm. there was um, just more people who maybe came to Easter services and yeah. were looking to re-engage with church and yeah. taking their journey seriously. And uh, so right. just that became a pattern for us about every September, January, mm-hmm. and April, we'd have a, at least yeah. a group starting, which gave people an entry point at any given time. Yeah. Cause the question we're asking or we're answering at this point is, you know, how many times should we start seven pillars groups every year? And I think what's cool kind of facilitated from this conversation is using sexual integrity 101, that video course. Yeah strategically can help kickstart some of those. Yep. So if you have that already in place where there's a rhythm to it every year, there are multiple times, you can have that set up that on the back end of that eight week course, you have seven pillars groups started Launch. there mm-hmm. and then you have leaders already lined up. And so you can, I mean, it's just funny, like you're building this recovery ministry as you go. It's mm-hmm. not that you have to build it all out and that, you know, it's not a build it and they will come and right. everyone will come to this. Like it's not Field of Dreams, which is a great movie, yeah. but it is something where if you can start and grow organically over time, like it's that flywheel kind of idea, right. like over time, it's going to create momentum for itself. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, if everyone, if anyone is hearing our answers and is starting to get overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, we can't <laughs> do all of it. Just yeah. like, if, if you're looking at your first group, that's all you need to worry about. Yes. Don't, don't worry about some of this. Be like present in that, when right? you get there, God will lead you and show you the path right, right. now. Just focus on mm-hmm. starting where you're at and, yeah. and trust that these further stages will come. But for others that are at that place, Hopefully this gives them some insight into how to start multiple groups and yes. handle uh, men that are coming. So uh, Mike, we know that full recovery can be a two to five year process in terms of lasting change in our brain and relationships, mm-hmm. but these groups are typically nine or 10 months long, meaning that at the end of group, there's still more time. So mm-hmm. uh, what is next? What can we do to motivate men to continue in their recovery journey after their first time through Seven Pillars of Freedom? Well. Um... I am a firm believer that every guy that goes through recovery should reach back and help other guys. So I'm yeah. always looking for leaders yeah. and co-leaders, and those kinds of things. So if the guy's been sober for six months uh, in his first group, I would encourage him to be a co-leader in another group. If a guy is still struggling, then I would encourage him to go through group again yeah. Yeah. Uh, just for that process. Um, I'm always, like I said, I'm always thinking about these leaders. And so I want all the guys in my group, regardless of where they're at in the process, to start thinking, how can I give back? Mm-hmm. And it might be um, that they, like I've had guys that go, we don't want to go through pillars again. We're all sober, um, doing well, but we want to stay together. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of them will do a book, book study, stay together. But I still even try and stay in touch with those guys and say, hey, really, how can you pay that back to some other guys outside your group? Because I know this is comfortable. I know it's comfortable to be in your group. Right. But the reality is God's called you to something bigger because he's, he's healed you in this process. Yeah. And he wants to help you pay that forward. Well, and what's so cool about Seven Pillars, and this is not the like reason that it was created. Like the first time through, I found sobriety. The second time through, I started to realize like I'm addicted to food, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. like this is an issue in my life. And I started to see that some of the same wounds that were motivating my unwanted sexual behavior were also motivating other areas of unwanted behavior. And for me. You know, we talk about the onion and the layers, like that's what happens when you go through seven pillars uh, multiple times. And I've been through it, I think three times, no, four times now, and each time is different. And there's mm-hmm. a new layer that I'm finding. And I, you know, there are times when you, you know, think about it, like, man, I've already been through this. How many, how many times do I have to go through my top 10 worst moments? Mm-hmm. But you get there again, and you're like, I don't remember thinking that in my previous groups. I don't know if I made that connection with my mm-hmm. dad growing up. I don't know yeah. if I made that connection with how painful that emotional moment was on the baseball field. Like you start to really make these connections more and more. And 
what's great is that is just that's fresh ground that it, like maybe you've been over these themes and these topics before, but you're experiencing it afresh. Right. And I think that that's another next step is going through it. I know, you know, Mike, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but I know you are committed to being in group for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And yeah. there are guys who are going to do that. And you're going to experience healing new every single time you go yeah. through that new season. It's going to be good. It, uh, you know, you brought up that point. There's two reasons why I will be in group. One is because I just want to stay committed to it. And it gives mm-hmm. my wife confidence that I'm yeah. on the straight and narrow. And it gives me confidence that I'm on the straight and narrow. But it also is the most rewarding thing I've ever done mm. in my life. To when, when guys first come in a group, uh, oftentimes their lives are hanging by a thread. Yeah. You don't know if their marriages are going to survive. They're often really squirrely. They have no confidence because they know that they're struggling with something that they view as super shameful. Mm-hmm. And just to watch the process as they begin to resolve the trauma and open up to their identity of who they are in Jesus Christ, yeah. and then become a leader, it is phenomenal. I just last week, a guy that I'd led through a group probably in 2014, he had been a missionary to China. They'd, he'd gotten somehow locked up in porn and he was paralyzed, couldn't do his job. They mm. pulled him off the field and they came, he got into group. We went through group together. He got sober. He's been leading groups ever since. He called me or texted me two weeks ago and said, I just graduated with my counseling degree. Would you be able to come and celebrate with me? (laughs) You know, and those kind of things feed my soul. Absolutely. I love knowing that. It's amazing. Not that I did anything, but that I was part of a process that God uh, initiated in someone's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In in this question on next steps, I think you've got to be attentive to what is God doing in your life? What's his purpose for you? Mm -hmm. For many men, it is going through group again. And there is... There is no shame in going through group twice mm-hmm. if you still need additional yeah, healing. It's like if two people have a shoulder injury and one recovery takes six months and one two years, we wouldn't look at the two-year guy and go, well, shame on you. What's wrong with... It's like, yeah. well, the injury was different or it required more extensive treatment. And, and that may just be the nature of one guy's struggle versus another. Um, and at the same time, using like that physical therapy analogy, if, if the shoulder is not healing and the doctor says, well, are are you doing all of the at-home exercise that I've assigned you? And the guy's like, well, no. <laughs> then what's the doctor going to say? They right. say, okay, well, you, we need to get you on this regimen of mm-hmm. doing these exercises to rebuild strength. And mm-hmm. so if you went through the first time and maybe, because I've heard this from guys, like they just kind of blunder their way through. They don't yeah. really commit. They, they do the bare minimum and right. they get to the end going, well, dang, I'm, I'm not making progress. It is kind of a wake-up call like, well, did, did you do all the exercises? Yeah, did right. you do the work? And yeah. if they say, well, no, and then it's an opportunity to say, I'm not healing like I want. I need to do all the work. And so just again, there's, there's no shame in going through twice for yourself. Uh, the other thing I would mention is if you're in a much healthier place, it's an opportunity to re-engage with the ministries of your church, particularly your men's ministry. I mean, yep. I, I look at the local church and say, men's ministries need men who are there fully alive, mm-hmm. aware of their brokenness, not trapped in shame, able to talk about their, their uh, sexual brokenness and recovery, because that's going to funnel more men back into recovery groups yes. than almost anything I can think of. And so if, if you feel like, man, God used this, it accomplished a great work in my life. Mm-hmm. And, and now in a way, going back to like that missionary word, I'm a missionary to the other men in my church. Right. Because as we know, there's a lot of them struggling, and maybe they do yeah. show up at the men's breakfast or the men's you know, game night or whatever your church has, because it's safe, it's acceptable. But if you're there also going, man, listen to what God did in my life, it's, it's just going to create that opportunity for other men. So mm-hmm. if that's what God has for you, pursue that. And that doesn't mean you've left you know, pure desire. That, right. that mm-hmm. means you've been sent out yeah. to continue using your story in another venue. Yep, it's good. Okay, so how do we handle, and we see this from time to time in churches, how do we handle the situation where a pastor or a leader in the church needs the seven pillars? Pastors are people too. They need recovery as well. But in this context, they need a seven pillars of freedom group in their church. Is it appropriate for them to be in the same group as guys from their church? And maybe what are some things, if it is okay, to be aware of in that situation? This is a really good question. And I think in some levels, it's above my pay grade. I have had (laughs) pastors in my groups, but they've never been my pastor. Mm, Okay. So uh, I think that's different because in in that context, um, to me, they're just like any other guy. Uh, They're not disclosing anything to me that's going to get back to their congregation. I do, however, know Nick. uh, That's part of his story. Mm -hmm. And so I'd kind of defer to him on this. Stumbo? Yeah. The two things I would say, if you are the lead pastor, or if it's the lead pastor we're talking about, I do not think their first healing group should be in their church. It just... 
so challenging to be leading yourself through this while other men and detaching your role as pastor mm-hmm. from your need for recovery. So I led groups as the lead pastor in my church, but it was after I'd been through a full year of groups mm-hmm. and counseling with Pure Desire somewhere else yeah. and with the support of my elders. And, and so then when I launched it in the church, it was kind of a, hey, I continue to need these groups, but I had some traction and, and it was a different place to be in. Um, and I think if your lead pastor, the other thing I'd say, the second thing, if your lead pastor is supportive, um, they, they embrace healing groups. They see that we don't want this to be an issue that disqualifies you. We want to help you get healthy. Mm-hmm. Then that can free associate pastors in that church, male yeah. or female, to be in groups. And so if you're in that situation where you know the pastors above you encourage this, mm-hmm. then I, th- I think there's great participation opportunities. But I know in, in many, many environments, there are associate pastors that feel like, I'm legitimately fearful that if my senior pastor knew I was facing this issue, I would lose my job. Yeah. And that, that's just a really hard decision to have to make about like, do I want to be vulnerable to the point of losing my only source of income? And mm-hmm. so in that regard, a pastor joining an online group, going to a group somewhere else can really be a healthy pathway mm-hmm. for them. So I, I think there are situations where it can work, but there are also situations yeah. where I don't think it's wise. Yeah, like for me, I was a pastor at a church and was leading my first group with guys that I was their pastor. I wasn't their lead pastor, which I, there is a, there is a distinction mm-hmm, there mm-hmm. to be made. I was also a lot younger than most of the guys in my group. And so there were some dynamics where it made it just more doable. And I had the full support of my lead pastor and our elders. Mm-hmm. So sometimes that can happen, but just I mean, the answer to the question is depends. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on the dynamic, depends on what the structure is of your church, depends on who's in your group, all of that. But also know that we have online groups specifically for pastors yeah, for this exact, re- this exact reason. is because we want something where you can sort of be anonymous. People know you. Like in these groups, you're going to be known. The people are going to know your name and the ministry that you have. But it's a way that's done in this safe place of other lead pastors or mm-hmm. other pastors that are in ministry that can really create that safety for you to be real and own your recovery and healing with the hopes then that you would bring it back to your church. And maybe you are leading some of those groups or you're at least encouraging people to lead those yeah. groups in your church. Yeah. yeah, as you brought that up, I did. I do remember a situation where I did have a pastor from my church in my mm. group now, yeah. um, not the lead pastor. Yeah, And he did uh, confess that he was worried about what the lead the executive Which is pastors such a would natural... think about him being in group. It's very natural initially. Yep. And over time, they did find out, and they were very supportive. Mm, uh, cool. I don't know if that's always the case. You just don't know. Yeah. yeah. I think it's right. It depends. Yeah. yeah. My dad. Well, guys, this has been awesome. I hope for everyone, whether they're a first-time group member or a long timer, mm-hmm. that there's been some new, fresh ideas for them. Uh, I know there has been for me. But let's let's wrap up as we often do. What are some of your your final tips as uh, how do we run effective seven pillars of freedom groups in our church? I would say if possible, work hand in hand with your pastors, particularly men's ministry, be involved in men's ministry yourself. Cause that's our demographic. Encourage yep. the guys in your groups to do so as well. Um, I would meet with your group leaders regularly to pray it, When, when I was overseeing these uh, as a volunteer at my church, yeah. we would get together 20 minutes before groups just to kind of talk through any issues that were happening and just to kind of encourage each other and pray for each other. I think that's really important. Mm. Um, you know, and like you said, I, I don't want to overwhelm people because it will grow yeah. and you'll come up with ideas. We yeah. tried uh, things that worked really well. I mean, we started in that modular and uh, before COVID hit, we had 70 or 80 guys in groups. We were doing quarterly mm-hmm. potlucks. We'd have guest speakers like Nick and Alan and People yeah. come in and talk. We'd have people share their testimonies mm-hmm. of healing. One of the things that, uh, if you're looking at a men's, um, like a group ministry for men, one of the things I think is super important is building a culture. Yeah. And one of the things I tried to do was when we'd have the potlucks, I would say, um, how many of you have been leading a group for more than one year? Raise their hand. And I would ask everybody to give them applause. Two years, three years, four years, five years. Then the very end, I would say, how many of you are in your group for the first time? Mm -hmm. And then I would say, can we give these guys applause for their courage to take this step? And what I was trying to do was to build this this culture where we were applauded for, uh, one, being vulnerable, transparent, courageous, and a leader, and giving back to the guys in the group. And um, I think that's so important. And and like Nick said, men's ministry is is struggles at churches. And this is an area where you can get guys who are real and transparent mm-hmm. to be leaders in their church. Yeah. 
My encouragement is to just trust and believe in organic growth. I know that you want to help everybody all at the same time and all at mm-hmm. once, but don't be discouraged by small numbers. Um, be encouraged that those three, five, seven men who are joining your group right now, maybe you're hoping for 50 mm-hmm. and you only got seven. Those seven men's lives have a really, really good shot at being changed mm-hmm. forever because they're in that group. And so focus on what's in front of you. Don't look at all what you're missing out. Mm -hmm. Trust that God's bringing the right people at the right time to create the right organic growth over time for ministry. Yeah, I think that's what came to mind for me is the phrase, stay the course. Because there's going to be high moments and low moments. There's going to be guys that flake out and guys that commit. There's going to be groups that are just home runs and groups that, for a lot of reasons, can just kind of flounder. And and I think in those low moments, there can be discouragement or be like, ah, this is so hard. Why do I bother? And, and mm-hmm. I think if we can stay the course and just be committed to it. Um, you know, and I would encourage you as a listener, when, when I've seen churches uh, that, that have seven pillars groups and then they don't, it's because no one really continued to carry the ball. Mm-hmm. They didn't stay the course. Everyone's like, oh, that was great. We did that. And then they move on. Right. But if God's put this on your heart, stay the course. Be the one at your church that's like every time an opportunity comes is saying, yeah, I'll, I'll lead another group. I'll help. And obviously you need to be aware of your own limits and not burn yourself out. But if you're willing to take that role, it'll make a huge difference. And you'll go through seasons where maybe there's just a few and few guys and other seasons, like it really flourishes, but Mm -hmm. it takes um, someone and then hopefully a a team of people that just say, you know, come hell or high water, we're going to keep doing this because we know the effectiveness it has in changing men's lives. This seems like I hadn't planned on this, but this seems like a really good place to share something that God showed me. When I was Believing that lie that you're not meant for ministry anymore, that you've been defiled, mm-hmm. that no one will accept you. <clears throat> I, had, I was leading a group at that time, and um, I was praying, and God, being an analytic, he gave me this kind of picture, and I created a spreadsheet mm. of year one, if I would help one guy to become a leader and lead a group. Year two, that guy and I lead groups. If you carry that out for 20 years, you think about, all the guys that are in those groups, I think it came to over a million men yeah. would be helped just by being That's faithful and leading one group a year. Yep. And I went, there are a lot of pastors who never have that kind of influence. Yeah. No one may ever know my name, yeah. but just by being faithful and showing up. And so I always right. look at that as, God, my job is just to show up, love, and see these guys, yeah. encourage them, and develop a leader That's to good. duplicate myself and... When I get to heaven, hopefully there's a trail of guys that walk past that mm-hmm. say, thanks, Mike, for your faithfulness. Yeah. That's awesome. So cool. Well, as you can tell from our conversation, uh, Pure Desire groups, specifically Seven Pillars of Freedom groups, are a large need for churches and a necessary resource in the discipleship of our men. Whether you're already running Seven Pillars of Freedom groups or are working to get them going in your church, we hope our conversation today really gave you a clear direction on how to run effective Seven Pillars groups for sure. Mike, uh, That was a really cool way to end the episode too, man. I appreciate all the work that you've done and you being here today with us. Appreciate it. I'm just so blessed to work with you guys. (laughs) God is so good. 